sure that this is uh, literally one case when there is no need for introduction. And so um, I will set aside my essay on this topic and not, not read it aloud. But I will, I will uh, point out to you some very basic things that you probably all know, and I apologize for them. In 1998, you probably know that uh, Mr. Farrar won the Neustadt International Prize for Literature. What he doesn't know is that at that very moment, I was offered the possibility of chairing the awarding of that prize. And I turned it down <laughs> for reasons that were entirely um, But I congratulate him on that, a prize which is certainly the most distinguished, here's this word that keeps coming up over and over again today, causing us all trouble. It is certainly the most distinguished US-based international prize for writing. And obviously, famously well-deserved. As you all know, Mimi Farah was born in Somalia. Uh, he has lived much of his life since his career as a writer began in exile. That exile has included time in many places, in the US and Minnesota, for example, in Cape Town, elsewhere. He studied in India, as well as in Africa. Consequently, given his personal history, he's polyglot in a way that most Western European, North Atlantic people are not. I'm not sure, but I think probably the answer to the question would be that his first language was Arabic. Right? No, so on. First written language. Yes. I'm um, Harry. First written language. Yes. But the, and this is probably something we can ask him to comment, late, comment on later. It's a question I know he always gets from interviewers. But it's a question I think is remarkably important and worth hearing him speak about. Just why he chose, given the languages at his disposal, to make English the language of his fiction. And this is a question that we wanted to hear. After having started to read, where is he? Bruce Robbins, a uh, draft uh, interview with Orhan Pamuk just the other day, and welcoming very much the opening question in that uh, interview, which went something like, to Pamuk, everyone wants you to talk about the politics of Istanbul. Would you like to talk about your literary writing? Part of Pamuk enjoys it profoundly. So I don't want to say very much at all about the crises in Somalia, about which I know only what I read as I say. But I'm hoping that this will be an opportunity for us also to allow Rodin Farah to speak to us, not only through his art, but if he, if he will allow about his art. So please join me in welcoming Rodin I will read first from the most recent novel, Crossbones, which ends a trilogy which began with Lynx, published 2004, continued in Knox, 2007, and ended, ends with Crossbones. I will also read from maps. I couldn't find any of my other books <laughs> when I was coming away, and I borrowed this from one of my students <laughs> because he had just bought it, and I was taking the train, and I said, "Could I borrow it?" <laughs> now I'll uh, set in context the passages that I will read from. Crossbones. And the context is very simply that the novel is presumed to be taking place 
three days before the Ethiopian invasion of Mogadishu on Christmas 2006. Since everybody in Mogadishu at that time knew that Ethiopians were going to invade, the group now known as Shabab decided what they were going to do was to do exactly the same thing as the Iraqi Republican Guard did when the Americans were invading Iraq. They were going to empty the city of their fighters, but they were going to occupy strategic positions in the city from which it was their intention to attack the Ethiopians. Not to attack the Ethiopians on the day they arrived, but first of all to suss out how things were. So in the pa first passages that I will be reading, one of their recruits, a young boy, literally, aged between 10 and 15, you could never tell how old they were. Malnourished, ill-educated, ill-informed, and so on and so forth, is moving. And his idea, his plan is to what they called appropriate, confiscate a house, gather their weapons in it, and to attack from it. Now I'll tell you one small little thing, and that is, he will, well, I should not. <laughs> A Yankee cap and Ray-Ban wearing boy of indeterminate age gets out of a car that has just stopped. He climbs up gingerly, like a spider creeping up a crevice. He retrieves the carryall from the trunk of the car without help from the two men sitting in the front. The men are old army hands, and although they haven't said anything to him, he knows that they do not think highly of him. The boy slings the carryall over his shoulder nodding his thanks to the two men in the car. They look away with obvious disdain. They do not wish to acknowledge his gratitude. He smiles with youthful bravado, betraying none of his trepidation. He does not want to fail. He cannot afford to fail. He is aware of the huge difference between martyring oneself and making a blunder of things and getting killed. Of course, he does not wish to die, not unless he has fulfilled his dream. He is small in stature, huge in ambition. On his first day as a draftee into Shabab, the instructor, upset with him, had pulled him up by the scruff of his neck shouting in Somali, you young thing. The nickname stuck and he answers to it now. The car reverses and he moves forward on the dirt road, his breathing heavy under the load he carries. It is hot. And just before noon he meets a woman in full body tent going in the opposite direction. The woman takes an interest in him, a small boned, small boned, four and a half foot tall figure, a dwarf, she thinks at first, hoisting a carryall bigger and heavier than he. She watches him as he puts the carryall down on the ground and sighs with a relief. She waits for him to remove his sunglasses before she will consider peeling off her face veil or entertaining any questions from him. 
Deciding to be on an equal footing with him, she takes off her face veil and then crouches close enough to him, looking straight into his eyes in an effort to put him at ease. They exchange standard greetings. She addresses him in the May peace be upon you Somali greeting, Nabad, and he, in preference, uses the Arabic equivalent, Salamu Alaikum. Can I help you, she says. You seem lost. He asks her to tell him the way to the Qibla. She takes her time, wondering if he is one of the young Shabab mules assigned to do their dirty work. The poor sod must be mistaken the Qibla the Arabic word for the direction in which a praying Muslim faces for north, she thinks. She wonders if he is a grown man with the voice of a boy or a boy in the body of a man. They stand on the dirt road in Iswarbikle, a rundown district of Mogadishu, sizing each other up. The woman, Ambara, the principal character in the second part of the novel, the trilogy that is. The woman Ambara is on her way to the Bakaraha market. She needs a few last items for the apartment. She is preparing for journey. And the journalist's son, Malik, arriving on the morrow. Now she lights upon a thought studying the young thing, that maybe he is passing himself off as someone he is not. Just as she puts on the body tent before she leaves home as part of her disguise, like a theater prop. Somali women who never used to wear veils resorted to them when the strife began in 1991. A protection from sexual harassment by armed youths. But lately, ever since 2006, with the Union of Islamic Courts to control of Mogadishu, spending, sorry, expanding the rule of Sharia law everywhere, veiling has become de rigueur. Women are punished if they appear in trousers or the less restrictive dresses that were common before the Somali Civil War. The boy's hair is the color of ash and is cursed with kinks that no comb can smooth out. <coughs> From the little she has heard so far, his voice is not broken, yet his face calls with the deep furrow she associates with the hardened features of a herdsman from the central region of Somalia, where all Somalia's recent political instabilities have originated. Shabab, the military wing of the Union of Islamic Courts, has been trying to terrorize the residents of the city into submission, she thinks, and it appears to have succeeded to a degree. She assumes that he is one of the conscripts charged with consecrating, or rather confiscating a house in the neighborhood from which he and his colleagues will launch attacks on the enemy target. Ambara points south, sending him in the wrong direction, well away from the northern, northeastern part of the city where she lives. Now we've learned one or two things. Number one, she misdirects him. Number two, he is going to confiscate a house. So what we're going to do now is we will go and find him when he has already confiscated a house. And then we will meet, then, we will meet in the next passage that I will read, we will meet three men with nom de guerre, the Shabab commandos, who are setting up their uh, operation center so that they could start attacking. The house that he confiscates, not only the wrong house, but he belongs to 
an elderly man who used to be a minister in the previous regime. So we will meet the old man in the next passages that I will read. We will meet the old man whose house has been confiscated and the, the one to the Nem de Guerre and the Nem de Guerre that they have fascinating names very fascinating Nem de Guerre one is called I can find it one is called Big Beard one is called Foot Soldier and the third one is called Truth Teller these are the things you, know, you, you need to know. And then you, the old man who used to be a minister in the previous government, who lives in America in Virginia, and who is visiting his son, because during the Union of Islamic Courts, Mogadishu was very, very little, peaceful, very peaceful. You could do whatever you wanted, as long as you didn't do anything un-Islamic. You weren't allowed to drink, you weren't allowed to look at a woman, you, you know, all kinds of things that one was not allowed to do. And the old man is called Lorre. Big Beard, foot soldier, and truth teller approach the house the young boy confiscated that is from different vantage points at the same time. Big Bird wraps his purple kefir, the, you know the kefir, around his waist, tucks in a revolver just in case, and scales the back wall. Foot soldier, a black kefir around his neck, accesses the same compound from a neighborhood garden. At the wheel of a pickup truck parked on the left of the gate, Truth Teller, wearing a red kefir, waits until the other men confirm that they are both in the house and that it is safe for him to join them. He starts the pickup and waits for one of his mates to open the gate. Then he maneuvers in the truck with caution pulling a wheeled vehicle on which guns and other weapons are mounted, hidden under a tapestry. The front gate securely fastened, the men assemble in the house to set up their operation centre. Big Beard calls the young thing over and without any warning punches him so hard in the face that he collapses in a heap on the floor. Everything is still for a while. The other two men watch as Yang Thing pulls himself up, half kneeling, his cheek swollen, his lower lip bleeding. When Yang Thing has recovered from his balance, sorry, when, he, when he has recovered his balance and stands at attention, Big Bird says to him, do you realize that your negligence and confiscation of the wrong house had the potential to cause the movement unnecessary loss of life. Go, off with you. Stand at the gate. The truth teller instructs him to stand guard at the gate while they have their initial meeting. With Yang Thing gone, Big Bird assigns to Foot Soldier the task of liaison duty to link the cell they are now forming to the principal cell in Verbigla district where the presidential villa is situated. He charges Truth Teller with the responsibility of bringing in the gun parts. With Foot Soldier on the phone to the command center, Big Bird starts to assemble the weapon. Lorre, the old man, is now in the bathroom with the door bolted and he eavesdrops on their conversation. When he hears all three men leave the house, he takes a hurried bird bath by letting the water drip into his cupped hands in the manner of someone performing an abolition in an 
arid zone where water is scarce. He looks at his face in the mirror and confirms that he badly needs a shave. It's a pity, he thinks to himself, that the blade is dull and he has no replacement. Just then there is sudden escalation of noise as Truth Teller returns, grumbling about the weight of the machine gun and bazooka parts. Borre hears weaponry being dropped near the door of the, of the bathroom. It won't be long before one of the men invades this space where he is confined, Dore realizes. Then he hears the sound of others pulling back, pulling their chairs back from the table and sitting down. Straining his ears, he makes out the odd word. The arrival of these men and their continued presence in the house can mean only one thing, he thinks, trouble. He surrenders to the wish to know more, if only to prepare for what is bound to come. He kneels down directly behind the keyhole, through which he can glimpse the faces of the men, discern their movements. Big Bear, as the others call the one in the purple kafir, is in his thirties, prodigiously built, hirsute, with a husky desert voice, his facial muscles knotted, forehead furrowed. He listened to his companions, now encouraging one of them to speak, now dismissing the other's comments. Lorre, the old man, assumes that Big Bird is the leader of the group. His purple kaffir is folded almost in quarters and wound around his forehead. His hand keeps coming into contact with the fold, caressing and readjusting it in a way that reminds Dorre of a vain young woman just returned from her hairdresser. Dorre does not need to be told that the kafirs have lately become fashionable among Mogadishu religionists. He remembers watching Pito too where one as Lawrence of Arabia, and how in recent years Arafat turned it into a symbol of Palestinian nationhood. But Rore cannot tell if the color of the kafirs that these men wear points to their membership in a given cell. Big Beard addresses the question to the wearer of the red kafir, truth teller, a man with a big nose and it easily inquires, what's bothering foot soldier? Truth teller replies, he needs the bathroom. <laughs> Big Beard asks, has the anything come back without our permission? Foot soldier assures him that the anything is outside. Sir, who is in the bathroom? It's locked from inside when he checks the outside door. Big Bird is growing impatient. He slaps foot soldier, shouting, what kind of a man are you that you can't hold your pee? Then he turns to Truth Teller and orders him to call Young Tim and asks him, is someone in the bathroom? Rory does not know what to do. He checks his face in the mirror, thinking even a dying man wants to look comparatively clean. He realizes with, with concern that it will also be the end of the boy. One moment he has a good mind to open the door and be done with it, the next moment. He feels inadequate to the task. He is dizzy, gulping air into his lungs, fearing that he will faint before he can open the door. Then he hears the boy say, old man, open the door. 
Dore unlocks the door and steps out. Foot soldier can't wait any longer and hurriedly pushes past him into the bathroom. Meanwhile, true Stella and Young Thing step out of Dore's way and keep their distance. Big Beard asks Dore to come closer to him, his eyes penetrating deep into Dore's fear. In a film, the old man thinks Big Beard would be the one who puts pulls the trigger, a hard man with not a yota of kindness. With such a man, you can never work out the cut and thrust of his intentions. Big Beard asks, why are you here? The old man answers, I live here. Foot soldier comes out in time to hear this. The eyes of all three kafir wearing men converge on young thing. Truth teller asks the boy if this is true. Young thing says he is a hobo squatting here. Foot soldier is angry because he had to wait for a long time before he could use the bathroom smacks the old man in the face. Tell us the truth. The sudden upswelling of pain overwhelms Dorothy. He says, I am telling the truth. Through Stella, for his part, hits young thing, the strike splitting the boy's lower lip and making it bleed again. He asks, is he a hobo squatting here or does he live here? Big Beard tells True Stella to stop pummeling the boy in front of strangers. He adds, can't you see I'm talking to the old man? The old man replies, I'm a guest, not a drifter. So who lives here? My son. What is your son's name? Dore now realizes that he has inadvertently brought his son into focus. All that remains is for him to say his son's name. Dore has two sons, and neither is in the good books of Shabbat. One of his sons <coughs> is in Beidawa, and he is a minister in the transitional federal government, which is at war with Shabbat. The other lives in Virginia, is an American citizen, and he often criticizes a Shabbat. Big Bird's expression now is fluid like dirty water going down a gutter, habitually moving in a downward direction. Dora is aware that Shabbat would be only too pleased to grace either of his sons with immediate beheading, and that he is not likely to be spared either. And even though he is not sure it will do anything good to the young boy, Dore hopes that his statement, which he intends to make, will have in it the vigor of settling a matter in dispute. He says, pointing at young thing, let me say for what it is worth that this young fellow meant no ill to you or to your cause. I would appeal to you to spare him. Islam is peace, the promise of justice. Because I may have misled him. Please. Dore discerns movement behind him, and from a corner of his eyes, he spots Truth Teller with his weapon poised, but not ready to shoot yet. He pushes Dore down with a butt of a firearm. Sitting on a chair, the old man feels the harsh metallic coldness of the weapon against his neck. Foot soldier says to young thing, you have proven delinquent in your behavior. Why did you do that? Young thing says, I won't do it again. Big Beard now orders young thing to get his gun from the carry hall. Young thing does as all without fear or sentiment. 
As he waits for instructions, he does not plead with any of the men to spare his life or that of the old man. Big Bird says, shoot him. Laura says, please. Young Tin can't determine if the old man is pleading with him not to shoot. Or if he's saying, go ahead and shoot. He looks towards Big Beard, who is busy fingering his long, bushy beard, twisting it with the concentration of a philosopher in deep thought. Lorre thinks that it is in such a, such a scene where evidence gains the upper hand, where violence, sorry, gains the upper hand, that one can hear bear testimony tragedy in all its registers, a country held to ransom, <coughs> a people subjected to daily humiliation, a nation sadly put to the sword. A foot soldier says, what are you waiting for? The time passes as slow as the death. Truth teller shouts, shoot! The young thing might as well pull the trigger and be done with it, he thinks. Without a flinch, or immediate regret, although he is aware, despite his young age, that his action will ricochet about in his brain and keep him awake at night, disturbed and jittery. He knows too that he is only postponing his own death, for no sooner will he shoot the old man that one of the kafirs will make him pay for the crime of not wasting the old man right away. He wishes he had listened to his older sister, a flight attendant, <coughs> who had offered him financial help if he agreed not to join Shabbat, but instead to go to school. Or to his older brother, who tried without success to recruit him as a pilot. Young thing should using the silencer. As a bullet strikes Lorre in the forehead, young thing is certain that he hears a seabird calling. Only he cannot interpret what it is saying or whether it's foretelling his own imminent death. Lorre falls off the chair, dropping to the floor in an uncoordinated heap of self-reproach. He is sad, that he's had no time to alert his son, his daughter-in-law, and his grandchildren to the ambush that awaits them. From his posture alone, you cannot tell if the old man is dead. He lies on his back, head to one side, eyes not wholly closed, his position suggesting sleep. Thank you very much. Well, there are the novel, it being the third part of the trilogy, is also about the vexed question. Is there or is there not something called piracy in Somalia? And the question quite often that the novel tackles is that in actual fact what's happening in Somalia is that there are two, two crimes. On one crime, the Western media concentrates on one crime to the total exclusion or indifference to the other crime. Because what's happening in Somalia is that there, are, there is no piracy in Somalia, the novel argues. What there is, is that there are hostage takers 
young boys and girls <coughs> who take small little skiffs, no bigger than you know, 12 feet by four, about 10 or 15 of them, and they somehow manage, somehow they manage, and they manage with the help of many others from the West and from other places that I can name. They manage to get hold of ships that are almost as big as this building and keep it for six, seven, eight months, three years, four years, and five years, and they feed the hostages. And what we usually know from pirates is that pirates kill <coughs> their hostages and take ownership of whatever they get hold of, which makes me think that this is not the case. The other thing that also the novel deals with, in a way, you know, continually, uh, through research, at the back of the pages, in fact, there are three, four pages of research at the back of the novel, where it does not make sense when you think of it, that young boys between the ages of 18 and 25 who are in a boat in a skiffs that are no bigger than 12 by 4 feet. How do they know when a boat carrying illegal chemical waste or nuclear waste or tanks being taken somewhere else, how do they know that this particular boat is going to be in their neighborhood within 10, 20 minutes boat ride, you know, skiff ride. Because somebody telephones them first from London, second from uh, the Suez Canal, communicates with them from Abu Dhabi and tells them that on such and such a day, at such and such hour, there is this particular boat that's coming take it, keep it, and you may keep it for as long as you want, but you must continue communicating with us. Day before yesterday, there was a very big article in The Economist, which was actually giving you the exact amount of money that changes hands. And the majority, much of the money, does not reach Somalia, because I went to the places with the so-called pirates and others have operated. And in many of the places where the pirates have operated, you cannot even find a hotel in which to stay. There is no comfortable life. There is no money at all. The majority of the people are poor. The other thing that's also very, very interesting is that if these people are supposed to have received half a million pounds, the pirates are yet to have received half a million pounds or so. How is it that they cannot afford to pay the small little kitchens from which they feed the $10 or the $20 a month that they actually borrow from these women in the small villages who keep them? The one thing that, however, that no one seems to mention, or not, not often enough, not often enough, is the fact that there is a lot of chemical and nuclear waste, and the burying of these wastes in the uh, shores of Somalia. And during the latest tsunami, during the latest tsunami, the tsunami has dug up so many of these tins of you know, drums containing poisonous material. And there are lots and lots of villages in the coasts of Somalia, the littoral of Somalia, come out with huge bumps on their faces. And women, pregnant women, that have actually uh, delivered uh, 
babies with all kinds of malformations, all kinds of malformations. So the novel, in fact, is a great deal of it is based on research. Would you like me to continue reading? Or should we answer some questions first? And then I can read from maps. This is a democratic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Like I'm to, open to to, to, like to hear you read some more first. Is that okay? Oh yeah, that's okay. I don't. I don't. I. Uh, I wasn't quite sure if questioning, if uh, <coughs> the answers to some of these questions might might interest some of them. They will. It's with tremendous worry, inexplicable though it may seem, that Jeble stares in his sleep, dreaming, and registers horses, neighing, donkeys, brain, cows, mooing, the night darkening just before dawn breaks, the muezzin, Calling. In the dream, Malik is surprisingly among worshippers, but he, close, he sticks close to Jeble, his father-in-law, looking anxious, as if he is suddenly unsure what to do, whether to place the right hand upon the left, below or above the navel, when standing, whether with head and body inclined and hands placed upon the knees, he should separate the fingers a little or not at all. He is aware that there are differences among the Islamic sects as to what to do when praying. But having not set foot in a mosque or prayed for almost 20 years, Malik is uncertain. And he watches his father-in-law with intent, so as not to embarrass him. A man standing nearby speaks of moaning madness reigning. Jebler doesn't understand what he's talking about. Nor is he bothered by the fact that he doesn't know why the man is still until he discovers that the man to whom he is talking is Malik, his son-in-law with a notebook in hand and pen ready to scribble away because he's interviewing the man. Billows of dust stare the distance of the dream, beckoning and Jebla wanders away in the general direction of the vortex of sand over the hills further east. Then Jebler finds himself in a neighborhood with which he is unfamiliar, where virtually all the houses are leveled, the roads gutted, the pavements reduced to rotted ravines, with unexploded mines scattered in the rubble. In a guard spot past a massive ruin that must have caused a bomb must have been caused by a bomb with the force of a meteor. There is a technical. Its mounted gun smeared with the blood of its victims. The technical is still emitting smoke. When he touches it, it's as warm as a living thing. Somewhere nearby are corpses left where they have fallen. Some of them Ethiopians from the look of their uniforms others, young Somalis. Then several of the dead Somali youths come alive and they go into a huddle as sports teams do. The huddle breaks. And they take what appears to be pre-arranged positions, speaking in the manner of actors rehearsing a badly scripted play. 
dressed in immaculate white and John in colourful kafirs, they sport long beards. Several women come out of nowhere, uniformly pretty, gazelle-eyed, the very image of the Huris of Paradise, to tend to the youths. Now the youth separate themselves into units. One unit digs up an arms cache from the rubble, rocked with bell grenades. Light and heavy machine guns, semi-automatic weapons, an array of homemade explosives. A second unit waits by the roadside, pantry. But they go quiet when several, several armor-plated pickup trucks mounted with anti-aircraft guns approach and the youths get in an orderly fashion. A third unit, composed of the youngest, receives training in explosives from the short man with thick glasses who consults a manual every time one of the pupils asks him a question. Jeb Blair has the feeling that he is not in a city, but in a village somewhere in the hinterland, but he is not sure Mogadishu has lost whatever shape it used to have. The city is now featureless. <coughs> as featureless, sorry, as a ground down cog in a broken machine. He is deeply disturbed that he is no longer, that the city is no longer the metropolis with which he is familiar. Its current residents imported to raise a fighting force. Everywhere he looks, he sees destitute men and women and children in near rags, wearily trudging by, many of them emaciated, their bellies swollen with undiagnosed illnesses, their eyes hosts to swarms of roaming flies. They seem exhausted, inarticulate with fear and vigilance, which imposes a further formlessness. A mine detonates in the vicinity. Many people die and many more are injured. Jabla checks if only of the limps are gone. Luck spares him this time. But he looks about in horror. Most of the dead and injured are young. There is little he can do to help. He meets a man as old as he is. When Jabla wonders aloud why the elderly have been spared, and while the young are dying by the hundreds, the old man says, we are alive for a reason. Jebley asks, but why have we been spared? Because, says the old man, I recruit the martyrs. You recruit them, they die, and you live on. I blood the young brood of martyrs, suicides, says the old man. Jebla says, the young die as martyrs, and the old live on, that's criminal. The old man replies, that's right, but not criminal. But that's absurd, Gebra says. On the contrary, the man says, it's exemplary to die for one's country. There is nothing as honorable as martyring oneself when young for one's nation. They become veterans later if they survive. Ultimately, Gebra says, it depends on the martyr, doesn't it? Has it ever occurred to you to give the young people the choice whether to live on or to die for a religious cause in which they may not even believe? The old man quips, it's the martyr's blood that helps keep the nation alive. Without that, there will be no country. The old man walks away and sits nearby pretending to pray. Jebla assists the wounded 
and then buries the dead in a mass grave with help from another woman. Then he leaves and walks past the house, caving in. He can spot human figures hanging from the rafters. He wonders if anyone will be charged with this mindless mass murder, if anyone will be made to answer for these crimes. Well, yes, they are now. They are now an affiliate of Biden, and they have been collecting, you know, money from the Arabs, and they have recruited a great number of Pakistanis, Afghanis, and other non somali <coughs> And what made Serb Shabab, in fact, succeed for a great deal of the time, and initially what made them succeed, is first, they came into prominence in the early years when the Ethiopians invaded, and their argument was, we are nationalists, and we are trying to defeat the Ethiopian invaders. And even after the Ethiopians have left, but before the Ethiopians left, they metamorphosed into Al-Qaeda affiliates. The way they recruited is also quite interesting. And this is something that the secularists have not been able to do or learn from. And that is, they usually look for the weakest among the youths. Orphans, you know, the civil war has reduced lots and lots of orphans in Somalia. Orphans without help, young boys with no school to go to, no life to lead, no decent life to lead. Young Somalis who've lived in Minneapolis or other places, <laughs> but who feel lost both in America and in Somalia, and to whom they tell, you know, they promise that if you do this and if you do this, you will go to heaven, whom they mislead. You see the misleading of the novel. There are many ways of, I mean, I've just read one, the first section, remember, the young boy is going somewhere and somebody misleads him. And then what does the other woman do, Ambara? What she, does she do? She further misleads him. Now this continuous misleading is part of the novel of narration, the narration of the novel, because they, uh, Shabbat, mislead the young people by telling them you could go to heaven if you die. And then while they are, or before they go to heaven or earn Hurulin, uh, Hurulin is, you know, in Islam, if you're a very good Muslim, and if you're a man especially, uh, the benefit that you receive later on would be the most beautiful woman, transparent kind of female, good looking and so on and so forth. Uh, so the promise that is being given includes also monthly income to the young people, food, somewhere to sleep, and when they reach the age of 18, 19, they are provided with a wife, and the wife and the children are all looked after by the community of which Shabab comprises. The states, the secular states, 
in Pakistan and Afghanistan and Somalia and all these places have no organization like that. Shabaab is well organized. And because they're also criminal, they know that their, the space in which they operate is always limited. Shabaab um, now, I suppose, occupy two towns in Somalia. But since you can't tell them apart from the other Somalis, especially the Somali recruits, they could be your brother, your sister, because you don't know. You, know, you live in one town, your brother lives in another one. He comes to your house, he stays with you, informs on you, or, you know, and then finally gathers all the information that they want to <coughs> and blow up somebody. So that's how they operate. And that's how they are. The war goes on, but um, they, you know, I would give them another two, three, four years before they are wiped out. But the longer, the, 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 the frequency with which Americans enter, the moment Americans enter, they become stronger. Because you have lots and lots of other people who volunteer and say, any Adul Amriki, Anyone who is an enemy of America is our friend. One doesn't know how to talk. Does that make sense? I was fascinated by the last passage that you read. And what seemed to be emerging in it is a kind of ethical scene, a kind of scene of ethical interrogation. Um, which um, I, I haven't read last one, I'm sorry, but which you know, neither have I. So <laughs> you've just written it, yeah. Um, and I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, how exactly do you see that uh, scene of ethical encounter or ethical interrogation uh, in which you seem to emphasize the generations, kind of the ethics of intergeneration? Uh, old men, old men to live while sending young men to their death, and of course, youth is a major factor in recruitment and suicide bombing. In many places where it has, in recent years, you know, during the madness of the Second Intifada or the Taliban in, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, there is a kind of element of that. And the movements themselves define themselves as the movement of youth. Both the word Shabab and the word Talib, yeah. right, self-consciously define the, the movement in question as a movement of the youth. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can just think out loud more about that uh, and about what exactly is, you know, say a bit more about what you think the ethical content is in that moment of interrogation of the recruiter. And then maybe more broadly, which is a very crazy question, but maybe more broadly, um, what is the place of youth in our societies at this point? If one of the things that youth is good for, right, is being recruited. Well, your question is too intelligent for me to answer right away. It's a crazy question. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, if you take Africa as a whole, and then not only Africa, but the world, go to the troubled parts of the world, or p places where there is... The God help us countries, as the... Um, Irish mother of a friend of mine says. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what happens very often, I, I live in South Africa in Cape Town, and uh, we have a similar situation in South Africa where the young guy, the elderly men and women and grannies live. But the reasons why in Somalia the young die and the elderly men and women survive, the reasons are different. 
One is the scourge. AIDS has killed the young and the grandparents and the elderly men and so on and so forth in South Africa live to raise more children who are likely also to die from starvation from you know, uh, uh, further scourges. I don't know, they haven't, they haven't come up with another scourge, but I'm quite sure in the coming decade we will have another scourge. AIDS has gone, so something else is going to come. In Somalia what happens is, and I have actually literally gone and asked some of these people, some of the people who, I, I happen you know, to do research a great deal when I'm writing a book like this, and I have spoken to some of these, some of these people. Now, the concept that they have is we have sinned enough as elderly people. The young can earn an easy way to heaven through committing suicide. And therefore, we are actually facilitating their entry into heaven. You see? Yes. Why? Because there is, in any case, in inverted commas, there is no life to live for. There are no jobs. And if the young people don't have a job, don't have a livelihood, no school to go to, they will be recruited by warlords who will use them to do that. And I remember asking one of the warlords in Somalia, I said to him, where are your children? This is a warlord, and he has about 3,000 young people. I'm staying with him, I'm having tea. I'm worried because my, my, my hand is shaking, knowing, of course, that if I upset him, I'm gone. Nobody knows that I'm in that particular house with him, interviewing him. After I said to him, where are your children? He said, uh, Canada. How many of them? Six. <laughs> How old are they? Now, this is a question, it, it didn't occur to him that I would turn the question on him. And I said to him, what, what happened? Where are they? He says, oh, tell me more. Oh, well, one of them is finishing university, the other one is doing medicine, the third one is an engineer, the fourth one is doing this, and you know, this and that and the other one. And I said, yes, your children are doing well. Six of them? Yes, six of them. All, all of them are finishing university. And then a young boy came to ask me if I wanted sugar for my tea. And I said, no, thank you. And as he left, I said, what about this boy? He's the same age as you know, your youngest child, whom you say is now finishing secondary school and will go into medicine. Why? Oh, he says, these people deserve no life. So these are arbitrary decisions made by people who protect their own, their, their own jobs, their own, you know, and so on and so forth, but who ask other people to, to, to die. The same thing was happened in Minneapolis. I went to the sheikh who recruited me. I went to the mosque. I don't go to the mosque very often, but I waited for him outside the mosque. And the reason is because it's quite embarrassing for me to be asking these questions in a mosque. So we met outside. And I asked him the same question. He said, I'm a facilitator. He didn't say he was a criminal. He didn't say any of these things. And then I reported this to you know the authorities here. And then they all looked at me and they said, what can we do? This is among you know, between themselves, they can do what they like. Americans are, are not quite uh, savvy about these things. So the moral question remains, and it will remain as long as there are no uh, formulas or framework of salvaging the entire society. You know, it's not only the young people who die. The whole society has lost a sense of direction. The entire <laughs> society has lost a sense of direction. And it's not only Somalia. It is the recreation of an Islamic myth 
which many people have no understanding of. And the less educated, <coughs> the better for Shabbat to recruit them. Because they offer them, they offer them, they say to you, you go to university, what will you get? You'll get a house. We'll give you the house now. You don't need to. What else will you get? A wife? We'll get you the wife. What else do you need? Children? Yeah. And then once they have children, you see, a 19-year-old boy misled into marrying, you know, an 18-year-old. Once they have children, many of them change because now they're, they're being told, you are now responsible for another life. You can't go, you can't do anything else, and therefore you must be part of the It's horrific. Yes. Any more? Yes, madam. Regarding your theme of misleading, was that a theme that sort of came out of your research and you wanted to work it into your stories, or were you writing about characters and this misleading sort of thing kind of popped up and then you uh, polished it some more? Well, it's, it's actually possible that I, I may have come upon it as I was doing the research. And the reason is because I was also, some of these people behave and speak as though they actually believe what they're doing. But I could see that they were being misled or that they were misleading. There is no reason why, you know, a Pakistani or an Afghani would come all the way from Afghanistan or Pakistan, because I met one of them once. And I said to him, you know, you're needed in Afghanistan. <laughs> you're needed in Pakistan. Why did you come here? He said, because it's a lot easier. He says, here you are more likely to encounter and kill a European in Somalia or American. Whereas in Afghanistan and Pakistan, there are you know, you have to kill an Afghani or a, or a Pakistani. So the logic, the whole entire logic and the system is in operational, I, I think, quite well. I think uh, uh, I also did more research, actually, into, into how the IRA was recruiting, recruiting people. All forms of recruitment are the same. Even, you know, the, 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 the American soldier recruitment or the finger that goes like that, you know, it's the same. They're being told, you know, when Bush was sending his, uh, you know, American Marines to Afghanistan, do you think they knew what, was, what they were doing? I'm sorry, I, I mean, I don't want to be thrown out of this country for <laughs> saying things like that. But, uh, I, I think they, they, they just let you in. They just let you in. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, they may not let me in again. Yes. I was actually once even approached by someone from the IRA uh, to procure weapons. And I said to him, what makes you think that I could find weapons? And he said to me, because he says, you know, you're Somali. <laughs> and Somalis find weapons all the time. <laughs> yeah. If there are no more questions, I'll read from maps. Yes, there is a question. What I really like about your narration is it sort of bypasses the question of whether or not there's an enveloping uh, frame that would lead or, or mislead. It's almost as if every scene is a scene in which a question of life or death becomes um, the matter and it, everything is so uh, stark as if the stories themselves are producing forms of life that somehow supplant the sense that there is no life that what, what seems every sentence you read 
it, it just feels it because the the sentences carry an ethical imperative to live that is foreclosed by um, the extremes of the scenes. It, so I know that the the questions have to do with with larger uh, ideological frames, but the stories themselves feel so alive with the need for life that um, they seem to refuse the conditions in which they're emerging as narrations. And that that seems the power of the of the story, that it it's almost refusing the conditions in which the stories are being passed on, which that's a comment, not a not a question. But mm -hmm. Yeah. Well actually the it's essential to think there have been very, very often. I lived in a number of countries in Africa, Asia, and, and I was thinking, for example, when you were talking about the Dandun, I'm one of those who was directly, directly influenced by Dandun philosophy. And the reason is, at the age of 19, I was given a scholarship to come to America and go to the University of Wisconsin. Madison. And I recall refusing to come to America. And I recall everybody thinking I was crazy. You know, because we in Africa think America is where everything is. And when I said I wanted to go to India because I wanted to bring, you know, Africa and India closer, nobody understood what I was talking about. And at the age of you know, 19, saying, well, there is something called Bandu. I don't understand what Bandu is, but I like Bandu. <laughs> and I'm going to India. And I went to India, obviously annoying everybody, literally. <laughs> literally. My parents, my brother, and everybody say, you're crazy. You want to become a writer. And the American who provided the scholarship to me said to me, no, it is. You're not going to become a writer. You're going to waste your time. You're wasting your talent if you go to India. What do you have in India? There's famine, nothing else. And in fact, indeed, there was famine. But there were more stories in India that connected me as an African to stories than there were, would have been in Wisconsin Madison. <laughs> and then that's three, sure. four, three, four years later, three, four years later, the same American who came and said to me, you're not going to be a writer. One day he's walking down the street in London, and what's this big uh, foils? Mm -hmm. And foils had my novel on the window, you see. The man looks and says, well, this man has proven me wrong. So what I'm trying to say is that there are many things that you know, without actually knowing what one is doing, there are many of these stories that come to haunt one, to tell one some of these stories. These are lives that are connected. And our lives are more connected than we actually think. Our lives are much more, much, much more connected. Yes, sir. But if I'm on... Um, well, let's imagine in America, like a, a Tea Party person, I don't really believe in the hopeful stories told by most Americans. I really only believe in stories of the destruction of that America. Uh, and so those, there's a bunch of stories that actually work quite well for people. That's, I would become a, a member of a violent group and, and perhaps but the problem is the sort of the, the, the I'm just trying to think about the, the way in which the, the, the optimistic enlightenment stories all, the tents all just sank. And um, is that, how, how, how does one reanimate them in some 
somewhere. Well, one reanimates them through the teaching of history, through the teaching of certain facts of life, including the fact that Mogadishu, the city where I come from, uh, was a cosmopolitan city long before New York was built, long before even London was, became a city as such. We're talking of, you know, a thousand, two thousand, a thousand something years ago. But if, if I were a Tea Party enthusiast, uh, well, Mogadishu has no existence. And the reason is, the reason is because Obamacare on computer doesn't work, and therefore it must be total failure. You know, I mean, the logic is usually a shorthand for almost irrationality, if you see what I'm, what I'm saying. I am, <coughs> I'm not worried in the short term what anyone will make of any of this, but I'm worried in the long term where and when you know, because I see no difference, literally, if you ask me, between self-destructionists like the Nazis in in the state, in sorry, no, not in the states, <laughs> some of them in the south, I suppose, because there is a refusal, there is a refusal to accept life, and the challenge is that one may, uh, you know, that one is facing on a daily basis. So it isn't really a question of optimism and vision. It's a question of the success of an art that produces the narrative and the story with full awareness of the details of history and experience, which then can be, I use a, use a word I don't normally use, can be somehow redeemed by the affection that is invested in the research, in the labor of the art, and so on. And although the content can be, as your story of the recruiters is, is horrible, the content can be horrible, the, the, the value lies mid and long term, it seems to me, the value lies in the, in the work that you do in writing upon those realities in order to make those stories, which not only enter mind and knowledge, but move and have affect for all the rest of us. Which is, it's, it's actually curious to me that that remarkable scene with the old and young men that you read uh, is, is the one you chose because so often I find when your work has this affective and affectionate quality to it, it's often women who are the characters that are primary in the writing, often because I think that, uh, to use a word that is almost embarrassingly not used in literary critical circles anymore, because it seems to me that somehow love is the ethic that not only sustains the effort to do the work, the effort to keep some sense of Somalia alive. Uh, Somalia may die in the, in the content of the story, but in the work you're doing, and in the not just the record of other people's lives, but in the production of the record of your life. Something, something will live, and something will be loving in the act of your creation. Yes, but you know, I am actually strengthened in my continued belief in the existence of Somalia, or my affections, and so on and so forth, because I am aware of the past. Yes. And I continually hold in my vision the past mm. and think as I go along through troubles and tribulations and trials of where all this is going to lead and it will only lead to a betterment and the reason is because you can't go further mm. you can't go far enough without actually meeting your past you know, I mean, you meet your past, the older, you, you know, in child, in, in, in old age, you go back to childhood. And this is, this is the way of 
of, of, of looking at it. These people, the recruiters, never go back to childhood. Mm. You see? And that is because of the crime they, they committed, of which they are conscious, you see, because of which they are, they are terribly, terribly conscious. This is also why, for example, there is continuous threat against my life, my me, you know, my, my. And then I usually say, well, I've done enough. If you come and kill me, that's fine too. I've done enough. I've done enough. Well, because I'm moving in the direction of a reconciliation with that, with that past, which is being continually denied. Being continued, and therefore the most cosmopolitan city in the entire Africa, huh? the most cosmopolitan city uh, south of the Sahara, has been destroyed through that misleading question, you know. And that is what I'm trying to do: is you know to say, okay, if you want to reconstruct Somalia the way it was. There is one of my novels in which every street, mm -hmm. every major street in Mogadishu is mentioned. Yeah. And I wrote this novel long before Mogadishu was destroyed, and it's called The Naked Needle, yeah. the one that I was talking about last night. Right. James Joyce's, one of James Joyce's chapters is in that novel. And I did the same sort of thing that he did uh, in, with uh, Dublin by making a character, it's 24 hours of the day, by making a character walk through almost all the major parts of the city, the cosmopolitan part of the city, built, you know, in 13th century, 12th century, 17th, 18th century. And then that novel obviously got me the so-called death sentence and so on and so forth. It's the end of that. So I want to know if you wanted to read another page or two, or I, if you I wanted could, to say something more. Well, I could read. Uh, I could read something quite small if I can find it. Uh, <coughs> uh, from from that. A scene, well, it's a lot easier actually for me to read just the beginning. Okay. Uh, in maps, there are different personae. There is you, I, and he. So this is you, and this is how the novel begins. You sit in contemplative posture, your features agonized, and your expressions pained. You sit for hours and hours and hours, sleepless, looking into darkness, hearing a small snore coming from the room next to yours. And you conjure a past. A past in which you see a horse drop its rider. A past in which you discern a bird breaking out of its shell, so it will fly into the heavens of freedom. Out of the same past emerges a man wrapped in a mantle with unpatched holes, each hole large as a window, each window large as a secret to which you cling, as though it were the only soul you possess. And you question, you challenge everything which crosses your mind. Yes, you are a question to yourself. You have become a question to all those who meet you, those who know you, those who have any dealings with you. You doubt at times if you exist outside your own thoughts, outside your own head, or mysteries. It appears as if you were a creature given birth to by notion formulated in heads, a creature brought into being by ideas, as if you were not a child born with the fortune or misfortune of its stars, 
a child bearing a name, breathing just like anybody else, a child whose activities are justifiably part of a people's past and present experiences. You exist, you think, the way the heavenly bodies exist. For although one does extend one's finger and point at the heavens, one knows, yes, that's the word, one knows that, that is not the heavens, unless, unless there are, in a sense, as many heavens as there are thinking beings, unless there are as many heavens as there are pointing fingers. At times when your uncle speaks about you in your presence, referring to you in the third person, or on occasion even taking the liberty of speaking on your behalf, you wonder if your existence is readily differentiable from creatures of fiction whose habit is taught one to top off as if they are one's closest friends. Creatures of fiction with whose manner of speech reactions to situations, conditions and being, and with whose likes and dislikes when folk tradition has made familiar. From your limited knowledge of literature, you feel you are a blood relation of some of the names which come to mind, leap to the tongue at the thought of a young boy whose name is Asker, and whose prodigious imagination is capable of wealthy signs of precocity, because you are this young boy. And as you sit contemplatively, your mind journeys to a region where there are solid and prominent shadows which live on behalf of others who had years before ceased to exist as being. As you sit, your eyes open into themselves the way blind people's eyes do. Then you become numb of soul. In other words, you're not yourself. And the journey takes you through numerous doorways and you are able to call back to memory events which occurred long before you were born. Your travel leads you through forests without any clearing, to stone steps too numerous to count, although when you reach the highest point your exhaustion disappears the instant you see an old man, grey as his advanced years, negotiate the steps too. You remember now that in the wake of the old man there was a girl, barely seven, following him as a goat follows a butcher, knowing what knives of destiny awaited. And you, you who had lain in wait and wash, you who had lain unattended to her birth, you lay in wait as though in ambush until the woman who was not expecting you existed walked into the dark room in which you had been from the second you were born and you were a mess. <laughs> you were a most terrible sight. The woman who found you described the chill of that room as a tomb. To her, the air suggested the dampness of a mortuary. You cried at her approaching and would not be calmed until she dipped you in the bathtub she had filled with warm water. Then she fed you in a draught of goat's milk. Did anyone ever tell you what you looked like when the woman discovered you that dusk some 18 or so years ago? No. You wore on your head a hat of blood, which made you look like a masked clown. And around your neck there were finger stains, perhaps your mother's. You displayed a nervous strain and you began to relax only when embraced either by another person or dipped in warm water. When you did not cry, you searched with your hands up in the air for somebody to touch. When day broke, once a woman shared the secret of her discovery with a few of the other neighbors, the men took over and they prepared your mother for burial. Alone with you, Mistra noticed that your eyes were full of mistrust. Your eyes, she would tell years later, journeyed through her, beyond her, to a past of unfulfilled dreams. And your stare made her feel inadequate. There was an element of self-consciousness in the small thing I had found, she said, 
it was so self-conscious, it moved its hands as if it would wipe away the mess it had been in. It moved its eyes. When not staring at me, she continued, as though to apologize for its shortcomings. And what eyes? And what hands? And I thank you.